Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that has no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to another 2024 edition of Scared to Death, Creeps Peepers, Roberts and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Hello, Lindsay. What up? Chick, uh, chick here. This is the last one that we will record in 2023. Yes, this is true. Yep, next week we'll all be on the same calendar. Woohoo! Uh, thank you again for all the recent ratings and reviews. Over 12,600 just on Apple Podcasts. Go, 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 go. Another 12,400 plus on Spotify and a 4.8 out of 5 on Apple and 4.9 out of 5 rating on Spotify. And we it's appreciate it. As, as a result, Spotify sent us a really nice blanket that I have commandeered <laughs> and kept for myself. So keep it up. I want another blanket next year. Uh, we really do appreciate all the uh, all the people you know leaving those ratings and reviews. It does help us so much. Next to word of mouth, it is the best way for us to find new listeners, and we are thankful. Yes, new listeners means the show keeps going. And, and that's it. Uh, what fan submitted true horror awaits us this week, Lulu? Oh, Daniel, I have uh, my first story is kind of a funny story. It's okay. uh, about a haunted object, but it was cracking me up the the ending of it. I think will give you a good little chuckle. Uh, but but what's curious about it is like what happens to our stuff when we die? Do we mm. leave any of our energy on an object? Can that object be transferred or can that energy be transferred? Like can we pick up on it? So it's a fun thing to explore there. Yeah. And then my second story is also about a different kind of haunted object. Uh, the Girl in the Painting is the title of the story. And it's just a, a strange occurrence of seeing a painting and then the person or persons in the yeah. painting showing up somewhere else like oh, what's yeah. that about you got a couple really intriguing ones this week intriguing oh is that going to be the new word of the year intriguing <laughs> i have uh i have my standard two uh the first story takes us to riverside california uh, i just recorded I an like, episode wait a second are you doing that on time suck yep yep i just recorded an episode of time suck set in riverside about bill suff the riverside killer uh the serial killer and i was i was looking into how to pronounce this uh notable location in Riverside, Mount Rubidoux. Uh -huh. And when I was looking up YouTube videos for that, I came across this video of Mount Rubidoux's shadow people Ooh. about them. And then there was a couple videos about that and did some poking around and found some creepy lore and a spooky encounter story set in uh, Mount Rubidoux. Okay, cool. And then after that, my last story is set in Ireland. Uh, I'll tell the haunted history of Loftus Hall, supposedly one of Ireland's most haunted places. And a cool legend is attached to it. Didn't you work with a comic something Loftus? Michael, Michael Loftus. Yeah. And, him and I, the American, American history, wise -ass? American no, wise ass, American wise. Yeah, I think that American was it. Some pilot for the history channel. Go yeah. ahead, you guys. Go find that on YouTube and get a really good chuckle out of Dan attempting to be a, like a history rapper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. It is special. We tried. We tried. Oh, it was so great. <laughs> as uh, as soon as you uh, have showcased your pre-game pre -game ritual spoopy socks, dun, dun, dun. I'm off and running with some setup for this first story. Try to keep it under control. These are banana socks. Okay. Try and just... I'll try to keep... Uh, you can you, I won't get too aroused. I'll, I'll share them later. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, okay. good. Uh, <laughs> don't let Mount Rubidoux's name fool you. It's less of a mountain and more of a large hill. It's part of the San Bernardino mountain range, rising to a height of 1,332 feet, west of the Southern California city of Riverside's downtown. The hill was named after Louis Rubidoux, a wealthy ranchero who owned the mountain back in the 19th century. Previously, it had been for many years, uh, perhaps for many centuries, known as Pachapa, the name given, given to it by the indigenous Luceno people, the people of the West. Today, another hill nearby is now known as Pachapa. No one seems to know what the word Pachapa actually means. Perhaps it means cursed mountain, Maybe Mountain of Shadows. Some say that Mount Rubidoux featured prominently in ancient Luceno spiritual traditions and that the strange shadow people still encountered there today were also witnessed in pre-colonial times and maybe connected somehow to old Luceno rituals. The shadow people are also thought by many to be connected to two other groups of mysterious shadowy beings 
who have been reportedly witnessed in two other California locations. The Dark Watchers of the Santa Lucia Mountains near Monterey. Do we do that? Yeah, we talked about them back in episode 114. Yep, sounded familiar. Good memory. Thank you. And a group of mysterious shadowy robed figures that have been spotted on the Cascade Range's large volcanic mystical peak of Mount Shasta. Oh, dear. In 19... Yeah, a lot of stuff with, around Mount Shasta. 1906, Frank Miller, owner of the now historic Riverside Mission Inn, Henry Huntington, a Southern Pacific Railroad magnate, and Charles Loring, a successful businessman in a variety of disciplines, purchased the land around and containing Mount Rubidoux and created a park. In 1955, this park was donated to the city of Riverside and named the Frank A. Miller Mount Rubidoux Memorial Park. The park now contains several well-maintained dirt and paved trails, uh, some leading to the peak. Since 1907, on the peak, a 26-foot high privately owned and maintained cross, the Sierra Cross, or Sierra Cross honoring the 18th century Spanish f- priest, Father Jun- Junipero Serra, has sat atop the mountain. And since 1925, the World Peace Bridge has also been located at the summit. A cobblestone tower and bridge that is a replica of a famous old Roman bridge in Alcantara, Spain, built between 104 and 106 CE. The bridge and tower on Mount Rubidoux were erected as a tribute to Frank Miller, designed as a monument to world peace. Insignias of the Allied nations from World War I were cut into a ring of sandstone near the top of the nearly 30 feet a uh, 30 foot tall tower with these beautiful monuments, well-maintained trails and a rocky desert landscape kept so pristine by the Riverside park system. It seems like an unlikely area to be haunted. It looks so tranquil, peaceful, and it is a peaceful area. As long as you don't see the shadow people said to inhabit the mountain or as long as they don't see you people who claim to have seen the shadow people of this mountain often say that before sighting them, you'll first sense the presence of something nearby, something watching you. Next, you'll hear disembodied voices whispering unintelligible things and sometimes disembodied menacing laughter as well. Then you'll either witness one or more of these beings appearing generally somewhere along the main trail near the top of the mountain, or they'll announce their presence by throwing stones at you. Strange as the stone detail is, it's been reported frequently. And not only are stones being thrown uh, a somewhat common occurrence, but numerous visitors to the mountain have said that after running away from whoever is throwing these stones and then turning back to look in the direction of where they were being thrown from, they've seen small pyramids constructed out of these stones left standing in the middle of the trail as instantaneously formed uh, or instantaneously formed little pyramids. That's weird. So strange. Uh, What could that mean? And these strange little clusters of stones always seem to vanish by the following morning. Adding to how weird all of this is, some believe that these shadow people have not just been witnessed on the mountain, but also inside of it. There are a lot of old tunnels beneath the city of Riverside. That fact is not disputed. What is disputed is how many there are, who built them, and why. There are rumors of tunnels that extend from inside the mountain to the historic Mission Inn Hotel and Spa, a mile away, and even beyond perhaps. The Mission Inn is also reportedly haunted with visitors to several rooms, regularly reporting witnessing ghosts, such as the spirit of Alice Miller, Frank Miller's sister. Uh, The inn was built by Frank and Alice's parents. Ghosts have also allegedly been witnessed at the inn's old entrance to the tunnels, often referred to as the Mission's catacombs. Some of these catacombs under the Mission Inn were originally designed by Frank Miller to display some art he had collected and to provide a place for guests to escape the heat back in the days before the advent of modern air conditioning. While some of the catacombs under the Mission Inn only date back to Miller, authorizing their construction in the early 20th century, others are said to be true catacombs, featuring the remains of those who died long, long ago, and these catacombs are believed to be connected to various tunnels, some built during the days of Prohibition to smuggle alcohol to the inn and elsewhere, others said to be built even earlier by former residents of the city's original Chinatown. One man posted the following about the tunnels on a paranormal forum back in 2017. I worked security at the Mission Inn from 1982 to 1985 when the hotel was closed for restoration. Along the way, I had the opportunity to explore almost all the tunnels from Mission Inn outward. When we were exploring the tunnel, we only got as far as the cemetery, which is nearly a mile away. Two vaults there had fallen through the ceiling and that tunnel was no longer passable without moving the concrete vaults. We had a tunnel map and were able to explore the tunnel from the mountainside down to the block passageway. So I can affirm that the tunnels were there in 1982. If you know what you were looking at, there is a screened vent above the tunnel on a street near the cemetery, street corner near the cemetery. 
Some legends discuss an entire abandoned and buried downtown area from the late 1800s connected to these old tunnels. Hmm. The tunnels, as the man in the previous post referenced, also connect to the Evergreen Memorial Park Cemetery, the rest just below the mountain. Frank and Alice Miller are both buried in the cemetery, and the cemetery yet another place in the area rumored to be haunted. The ghosts of Frank and Alice have been reportedly been witnessed by many walking together past the tombstones at night. So much paranormal activity has been reported in this area. After a series of cave-ins, entrances to these tunnels were closed off to the public in the mid-1980s, but do the Mount Rubido shadow people still use them? The author of this following post seems to believe they do. Time now for the tale of Mount Rubido's shadow people. I stayed at the Mission Inn with my wife back in the summer of 1997. We were in town for a wedding, a wedding taking place at the Mission Inn, and everyone in the wedding party was staying there. The wedding was on a Saturday, and we got in late on the previous Wednesday. Almost everyone else was getting in on Thursday or Friday. My wife is best friends with the bride, and she went to help her make some final arrangements and have a quick drink shortly after checking in. Not being particularly close with the groom, who was spending some time with family in town for the wedding, I was on my own for the night. So I decided to go for a little jog before grabbing a late meal and a nightcap in one of the inn's bars and then reading in bed until I either fell asleep or my wife returned. When we checked in, I asked the clerk at the front desk where a good place for a night run was. The sun would be setting soon, and she suggested a jog over to Mount Rubido. I was, if I was fast enough, I could make it up to the peak in time to catch the sunset. She said the view was spectacular, and she was right. After tossing our bags into our room and changing, I was off just before my wife left to see her friend. The run was about a three-mile loop, perfect to sweat out the airport and flights I'd been on. Just enough to get good and hungry for dinner and nice and tired for a good night's sleep. Nothing strange happened until after I watched the sun go down from the peak up by the big cross. The temperature was ideal. The sky was full of red, orange, and purple hues. It was a gorgeous sight. I was far from the only person watching the sunset. The park was still fairly crowded. Dozens of other people, if not more than that, were hovering and hiking around. So a few minutes later, when the first little rock hit me on the leg on my way back down, my first thought was that it had probably just been kicked loose from the ground by somebody walking up above me. I didn't even think I fully stopped running. I just looked around, didn't see anyone who acted like they had thrown anything, and kept jogging. The second rock, though, it felt deliberate. It hit me in the back of my shoulder, and it hit me hard enough to really sting. I think I even yelled out a bit. The next day, I'd have a small bruise. That time, I did stop and look around. I didn't see anyone who looked suspicious. Actually, I didn't see anyone at all. For the first time since I'd made it to the park, I could look around and not see any other people. I remember thinking that that felt odd. It didn't make sense when I knew so many other people were still around. I wondered if some local teens hiding just off the trail were maybe messing with me. But if they were laughing, I certainly couldn't hear them. And I think some part of me already knew at that point that kids weren't responsible for what happened. As I continued to scan my surroundings, I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched and not by some kids, by what I didn't know. I could hear some people walking along the trail and talking in the distance, but also I could hear some other people talking quietly in some language I'm not familiar with. People who sounded very close, close enough that I should have definitely been able to see them, but I couldn't. Feeling a, a bit spooked now, I turned around and started running again. Damn it! I yelled just a second or so later when the next rock hit me right in the neck. Oof. That one really stung. Another soon to be bruise, a bigger one in such a tender area. Hey, you just hit me in the neck, asshole. I stopped and yelled to no one. You think this is funny? We'll see if you're still laughing when the police come and charge you with assault. I was heated. Whoever was throwing the damn rocks certainly had my attention. I spun around wildly trying to see who did it, but I couldn't spot anyone. And it was getting pretty dark now. I was about to yell again, and that's when I saw them up the trail. Three shadowy figures, human-shaped, but a part of me knew right away these were no humans. The other part of me, the part that felt that no matter what I was looking at, they had to simply be humans because my brain did not want to entertain any other possibilities, yelled out. Did you just throw that rock? The figures didn't move. Not at all. Didn't seem to react in any way. They just stood there, about 60 or 70 feet off in the distance. I remember not being able to hear any other voices now. It made me so uncomfortable. 
I'm sure plenty of other people were still around, but in that moment, it was like me and those three figures had the entire mountain to ourselves. I was about to shout out to them again when another rock hit me, directly in the center of my chest this time, right in the sternum. Ow! What are you doing? It came from the direction of those three shadows, but none of them had moved an inch. So how could they have thrown it? Now I felt scared. What if the next rock they threw hit me in the head or the face? What if it knocked me out? What then? I decided to turn and run down the mountain and back towards the hotel. As I ran, one more rock hit me in the back of the leg. I almost tripped and fell, but I managed to keep running. I was hauling ass. I snuck a glance back in the direction of where those figures had been standing as I rounded a corner, but they were gone. I wondered where they could have gone. There's not a bunch of trees on the hill, really none, that they could have quickly hidden behind. The way they vanished just made no sense. I never saw them again on the mountain, but as I was running back to the hotel, I passed by a cemetery near the bottom, and I watched them walk out of the mausoleum. Uh. The same three figures. They'd either just teleported there or taken some other way down. I ended up reading about some underground tunnels years later when I was still trying to make sense of all this, and in my gut, I think that's how they made it to the mausoleum. Now my run turned into a sprint. I didn't get hit with any more rocks and didn't see them again on the way back. Once I made it back inside the hotel, I heard into my room, shut and locked my door, then took my clothes off to take a shower and examine where I'd been pelted to see if I already had any bruises. My skin was red and puffy in a few places. I was already trying to rationalize everything as some strange prank, some teenagers wearing dark cloaks or something, targeting random people to harass and freak out for some cheap laughs when I felt watched again. I had just gotten out of the shower now and dressed, and I peeked out a window into the big open courtyard below, where I could see a few people sitting, chatting, having some food and drinks. And then just beyond them, in a corner of the courtyard near some rose bushes, there they were. Just standing there, all three of them. I couldn't see their eyes, just dark shapes, but I knew they were staring directly at me. I felt panic rising in my chest, such an intense sensation of fear and dread. Knock, 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 knock! There was someone at the door. I looked over towards the door for no more than just a second, looked back, and they were gone again. Now I knew it was no prank. No real people could disappear that quickly, and they'd done that twice now. Nervously feeling like I might have a full-on mental breakdown, if I were to see them again, I walked over to the door and opened it. Thank God. It was just someone from the hotel delivering a little welcome gift for my wife and I for being part of the wedding party. Moments later, I went and grabbed dinner in the inn's Italian restaurant, where there were numerous tables far enough from any windows to not be able to see outside and not have anyone outside see you. It was pretty crowded, too, which was perfect. I did not want to be alone anymore. And that was it. I never saw them again. I took my time with dinner, then had a few drinks in a little bar, the presidential lounge, I think, again sitting nowhere near a window. I didn't return to my room until after my wife made it back. And nothing else happened the rest of the trip. I told my wife about the rock throwing, but left out details of seeing the shadow people. She gets pretty freaked out by anything paranormal. I didn't want to scare her. Better to let her think it was just some assholes pulling a prank. Years later, when the internet had a lot more information on it than it did back in 1997, I came across some other people talking about reports of strange shadow beings being witnessed on Mount Rubidoux. I'm convinced that's what I saw that night. Some shadow people. They're who followed me back to the inn. Who are they? What did they want with me? And what do they do down in those tunnels? Great question. Mm-hmm. What are they doing down there? What are they doing? So funny, when you uh, finish a story, you usually write in the last like two or three words, look at me, uh-huh. and you were still in your book. So I was like, uh-huh. I know, are you, I know. Are you done? Done? <laughs> I didn't done? Give, done? I didn't give the cue there. <laughs> you didn't give me your visual cue. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm glad that he ran. I was about to tell him to get the fuck out because I was like, listen, buddy, <laughs> let's go. You got two legs. We got to go. Uh, that is so uncomfortable because the way that starts, I mean, you were a runner for a period of time. I was a yeah, runner a for a bit, period yeah. of time. So it's like, I don't know if you ever did any like trail running, but. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Or just even like uh, just being on a, a road that has some loose gravel. Yeah. I think we've all pelted ourselves unintentionally yeah, like with a little tiny that stone feeling yeah. mm-hmm. you're like oh damn it mm-hmm. you know and if Kick you get up yeah it sucks so like the initial one yeah it's like yeah whatever but then they keep coming that's yeah. like uh it just feels like you would be dodging bullets like uh-huh. I, you don't know where it's coming from you don't know how to protect yourself yeah yeah and and that hurts mm-hmm. yeah yeah strange little the, the rock throwing detail i hadn't heard associated with like other shadow people sightings and stuff it's quite rude, honestly. <laughs> I'm not I'm not here for it. I have some pictures. Okay. 
This first one is a view from below uh, looking up at Mount Rubidoux, just to get a you oh, know, sense of it. Okay. So just very rocky, no real vegetation. This one, uh, there are other photos which I didn't include that show it with like more like grass and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing this was taken in the winter. Yeah. So, you know, it might be Fire a little more season. green. Yeah, but there's no like trees or anything on it. Um, this next picture is the turret and bridge, that little replica atop the mountain. Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cool landmark. Okay, and that already looks prettier, like mm -hmm. more enticing. Yeah, so there's like a couple trees up there on that side, you know, the landscaped around it probably. And then this next one, uh, the cross at the peak, which is, you know, another landmark there. Okay. And also just shows that it's, you know, pretty rugged. There's like a paved trail you can see in the background, but not places really for people to hide. There's just a few, like literally just a handful of trees. This feels like weirdly familiar. Were you and I ever out here? I don't think so. I maybe think I lived there in a production. Yeah, I've been to Riverside maybe. a gajillion times. Um, this next one, the courtyard of the Mission Inn. And there's, I could have included so many pictures of this Mission Inn. Wow. It's actually architecturally pretty significant. Like it's the, whatever, I can't remember the exact style of this architecture, but it's the best example of it, at least in the U.S. Wow, that's incredible. Massive, opulent, really cool looking building. Did you ever see it at the Mission Inn in Santa Barbara? No. I, mm. I, I've, uh, I've only, I don't know. What? Actually, actually, I don't know that I've been to Santa Barbara That's or maybe it. I just th drove through it once. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> it's so beautiful. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Really special place. And then one final pick. This is just a little Photoshop of what a group of shadow people might look like. This is, I just uh, saw this and I was like, oh yeah. Other than the little glowing eyes, perhaps, but just like seeing those things out in the distance. Yeah. That wouldn't be fun. Uh, this image comes from the SoundCloud account of Diego Asturias from his track School Rooftop Loop Sad Re-Edit. Okay. This is a, this is what accompanies it. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, actually, it was a cool like I listened to it a little bit. I'm like, that's oh, cool. Like good like ambient, atmospheric music. Yeah, yeah. Instrumental stuff. Um. Okay. When you, I don't know why my brain went here. Uh, thinking about gravel. I like what there's down where you're from. Uh -huh. There's the recreational gravel pit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, just for fun, if you want, you can go climb around in a gravel pit. Like what kind of fucking middle of nowhere shit is that? I know. I think it's for like if you need some gravel, I think you can get it from there. But it is funny that it's called on a sign like, yeah, recreational gravel pit. It makes it sound like it's a fun gravel pit. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, you know what we could do today? Yeah, It'd be go. so fun. And of course, like our kids were like, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's go, go to the gravel to, pit. Let's go run up the gravel pit. <laughs> kids are so great that way. I do love that. Uh, somebody was talking to, to uh, or texting with a friend of ours. They were talking about like how excited their kid was to play with the box that the gift oh, came John. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John. John. Oh, that's right, right, right. Yeah, yeah Cohen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, yep, exactly. And it's like, it just made me think about like, you know, kids just, you really don't need much. Just an yeah. imagination, time. You know, if you have like a supportive, loving environment, you know, you're a well-adjusted little kid. It's like gravel pit, piece of cardboard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, was there ever like a box in your neighborhood? Well, I guess it was probably different for you the way like, because you would go to the dump. We didn't go to the dump growing mm, up. Yeah. I, I didn't even know that that was a thing until I moved to Idaho. Yeah. But so if you, because you could leave anything on your front lawn and the the trash collection would get it. Oh, yeah. Okay. And there were certain days for like big items, right? Yeah. But if somebody got a new refrigerator. Oh, then the to play with like the box. The box. Oh my God. It was like <laughs> the best thing. I do remember being excited by large boxes when I was a little kid where it's like, oh, we could like turn this into, it was always like we could turn this into a fort. Oh, yeah. Turn mm -hmm. it into a fort. We could turn it into like some sort of like yeah. sled oh. kind of situation. Fort, sled, or ideally, if you have like siblings, you make the younger sibling put the box on them, oh, kind of like their robot, and then just beat the shit out of them while they're inside the box. What you is just, triggered? Just... <laughs> I bet Tyler was in a lot of boxes when he was a kid, oh, being the youngest of his siblings. <laughs> were you? Were, were you? Oh, absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah. Beat the shit out of me all the time. Uh-huh. Force. Oh, I, I bet, did they, um like, shut the box closed? It wouldn't let you out? That was a classic. That's why I'm claustrophobic now. You can stuff you in the in the, in the dryer and turn it on. <gasps> put you in garbage cans and roll it down the hill. Oh, all man. Uh, I, I was going to have some camaraderie with you. Uh, uh, I don't think that Tyler knows this story yet. Uh, my cousin, Shelly, oh, yeah. and my brother, they would— So, Shelly would babysit us. She was old, She's older than my brother. And by babysitting— her and my brother. I thought Tony and Vince would do this to you. Well, they're all they're all siblings. Yeah. Shelly, Kelly, Tony, and Vince, all siblings. Yeah. So they were all in on it except for Kelly. Uh, various uh, different times. They would lock me in a closet uh -huh. and leave me in there endlessly for hours. Yeah, like, well, they had in. fun. They would have pizza. They'd watch <laughs> TV. And, oh. and then, oh, yeah. of course, it was like, if you tell your mother uh -huh. 
That pizza tasted so much better just listening to your screams from the closet. I think it was Vince because now I'm remembering that uh, Shelly and my <laughs> brother made me pretend to be, I was a fat kid, and they made me pretend to be Shamu. <laughs> and they would make me flop around. They <laughs> I love how hard dance I'm right now. <sighs> Jason and Shelly would lay, he would lay on his side, yeah. right? And then she would lay, so they would be hand hand to foot, foot to hand, right? And uh-huh. so they would they would be the perimeter of the pool and they'd make Shamu, oh my God. me, Get in the middle and flop around and try and get out of the the pool. Classic, classic cousin abuse. That's that is just happening in my living room. You, my living room on a Friday night. You've met my cousin Matt a few times. Yeah, um, uh, I remember one of the last times I saw him. Like we were joking around, and he's like, I don't know, eight years younger than me or something, something he's like my that. Age. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right. Yeah. You know, Six, seven young, years, so. spry. <laughs> you get it. And uh, he just got like serious all of a sudden. He was like. Why did you slap me around so much when I was a kid? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you guys, he was like, "You guys used to beat the hell out of me." And I was like, "I don't have a good answer for that. It was just fun. You were smaller." I hear the was, laughing out there. Yeah, it was a good time. Oh <laughs> man! All right, well, uh, so funny to me. Okay, at least you didn't make him pretend to be Shamu. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I have to find for you some like old fat Lindsay photos. Yeah, yeah, they're special. really special. No, you're so cute. I've seen them. I don't. You're a cute little kid. Let me find him. Uh, okay, you ready to move on to my next story? Yeah. Is it hot in here? No. Okay, I'm just going to drink coffee. Okay, I will share a bit of history before we dive into the paranormal aspects of this story. Loftus Hall, uh, a very large, historic, so-called country house in County Wexford, Ireland. Over the many, many years of its existence, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, have come to visit a place now referred to on a variety of lists of paranormal sites as the most haunted hall in Ireland. According to legend, the estate has long been haunted by the spirit of a woman who once had a brief romance with the devil. Oh. The property's history dates back over 850 years to 1170 when Redmond the Large Fitzgerald landed at Baganbun Baganbun Head along the Hook Peninsula. And I'm sorry, Redmond the the Large? Yeah, Redmond the Large. Hell yeah. I like him. (laughs) <laughs> Fitzgerald acquired land that overlooks Slade Harbor along the Hook Peninsula and constructed the original castle. Two centuries later, in 1350, the Fitzgerald family constructed another grand castle as the Black Plague devastated the continent, and it was this castle that became known as Redmond Hall. Three centuries after that, in 1642, a year after the start of the Irish Confederate Wars, a conflict between Irish Catholics and British Protestants, Redmond Hall was attacked by English soldiers loyal to King Charles I. As a result of the conflict between the British and the Irish, the property was divided, and Fitzgerald's descendants were evicted from Redmond Hall. A man named Nicholas Loftus soon took possession, which is how the property became known as Loftus Hall. The Loftus family were English planter English planters who had owned land in County Wexford since 1590. The hall became the family's primary residence in 1666 when Henry Loftus moved in. The Loftus family would now live at the property for the next two plus centuries. Meanwhile, as the years passed, the Loftus family rose in rank in the British peerage system. In 1800, Charles Loftus, a baron born in 1738, who'd lived until 1806, would become the Marquess of Ely. And it can be assumed that nearly all the individuals who owned the manor starting in the late 18th century, when Charles and his family still lived there, witnessed at least some paranormal activity. Time now for the tale of the haunting of Loftus Hall. The paranormal lore surrounding the Loftus Hall begins with the family of Charles Loftus. The first Marquess of Ely was born Charles Tottenham. He assumed the surname of Loftus after inheriting the estates of his uncle, Henry Loftus, first Earl of Ely. He married Jane Myhill in 1766, and the couple had two sons, John and Robert, and a daughter, Anne. And according to legend, sometime in the late 1700s, Charles, Jane, and Anne, now a young woman, were at home while the two sons were away on business. And one evening, they were trapped inside during a fierce thunderstorm. Many ships would anchor along Hook Peninsula, and it was not uncommon for the Loftus family to provide shelter to the sailors. On this night, a single ship arrived at Slade Harbor, and a single mysterious man walked off the ship to the manor's front door, seeking a place to stay for the night. The family welcomed him inside and were soon charmed by his friendly and polite demeanor. Young Lady Anne was especially enamored with him. The family invited the young man to stay as long as he pleased, and in just a few days, it was clear that he and Lady Anne were both quite fond of one another. Mm -hmm. A courtship had begun. But according to the lore of Loftus Hall, it was a very unnatural courtship. 
One evening, the family was enjoying a game of cards with the mysterious man when the night took a very unexpected turn. Anne bent over to pick up a card off the floor, and when she did, she discovered that her new romantic interest possessed cloven feet. She reportedly began to scream, as she knew that could mean only one thing. Her lover was the devil himself. Upon being discovered, the man stood up, transformed into his true hellish shape, and burst through the ceiling in a ball of flame, vanishing from the house and leaving a large hole in the roof as a reminder of his evil presence. Anne was so distressed by the sudden end to her love affair and the horrifying discovery that led to it that she had a complete mental breakdown. According to a tour guide for Loftus Hall, Anne first fell into a state of deep unconsciousness. Then when she awoke, she began hissing, spitting at, and attacking her family. Not knowing what else to do, her family locked her up in her favorite room of the house, the tapestry room. And in this room, Anne would suffer greatly. Mm. She refused to eat or drink and sat curled up by the window waiting for the stranger, her satanic lover, to return. And lived locked up like this for almost 10 years. Or at least she did in this telling of her legend. According to another version of her story, Anne soon discovered after being locked away that she was pregnant with the devil's baby. And that was why she and the evil child would continue to be locked away. In a variation of this version, Anne gave birth to the demonic child alone, at which point her family came in and killed the baby. <gasps> and then hid its body inside one of the walls of the tapestry room. Ugh. Anne would remain locked up in the very same room until she died 11 years later. In yet another variation, both Anne and the child died because the family refused to allow a doctor or a midwife to attend the birth. The family then hid the infant's body, hoping to keep Anne's affair a secret, and then gave Anne a proper Christian burial. Interestingly, Anne Tottenham was buried in a graveyard in County Wexford, where her tomb was sealed in a way other graves there are not. It's as if whoever buried her did not want anyone to be able to exhume her remains very easily. Not long after her death, her family, servants, and house guests alike started to claim that Lady Anne's ghost was now haunting the manor. And the majority of the sightings of her spirit, unsurprisingly, have occurred in the tapestry chamber. The first known report comes from all the way back in 1790. A man was invited to stay at Loftus Hall and was put in the tapestry room for the night. Just a few moments after he blew out his candle to go to sleep, plunging the room into total darkness, he felt something heavy jump onto his bed. Heard growling, sounded like it came from a wild dog. The bed curtains were then torn back and the bedcloths pulled out from under him. He relit his candle as quickly as he could to see the source of the turmoil and found the room to be completely empty. Adding to how disturbing this scene was, the windows were still all shut and the door was locked. Whatever he had heard had not vacated the room in any natural way. Many years later, a man named Mr. Shannon, the valet of the Marquess, stayed in the tapestry room during his visit to the house. On the first night of his stay, the Marquess was awakened by Mr. Shannon's, Mr. Shannon's piercing screams. Mr. Shannon would tell the Marquess that as soon as he blew out his candle, the bed curtains were, just as before, pulled back. This time, a woman in a silk dress standing by the bedside was claimed to have been witnessed. Mr. Shannon was so terrified that he threatened to quit if he ever had to stay in the tapestry room again. Following that encounter, a reverend named George Reed would stay in the tapestry room. While lying in bed one night, he said he heard and watched the door open and then witnessed the ghostly figure of a woman float into the room before disappearing into the wardrobe. He was fascinated rather than terrified and claimed to watch this same woman return the very next night. This time, Reed would say that he tried to grab her and was astonished when his arms passed right through her. George somehow slept soundly in this room after this for the rest of his visit. Multiple other visitors have made the same report of a ghostly woman in a silk dress walking through the room before disappearing into the wardrobe ever since. At some point in the mid-19th century, a local priest named Father Broders was called in to perform an exorcism. It was first thought that he had cleansed the house of any and all negative energy, but this would soon, soon turn out to not be true. Between 1872 and 1884, a descendant of Charles Loftus, a man named John, oversaw major renovations of the old manor. John's mother, Lady Jane Loftus, was a lady of Queen Victoria's bedchamber from 1851 to 1889, and the renovations were completed in hopes that she would come to visit Loftus Hall, but she never did. The tapestry room was then transformed into a billiards room, and during renovations, an infant skeleton <gasps> was allegedly found inside one of the walls. This was believed to be the remains of the child of Lady Anne. After the renovations were complete, servants said they began hearing horrid noises 
coming from the billiards room at night, noises associated with Anne's spirit, thought to be angry over the renovation. A story about the haunted house would now appear in a local paper in 1882, titled Miss Tottenham's, Miss Tottenham's Ghost, a true story told at Windsor Castle to Queen Victoria. Lady Jane was the one who told this story to the Queen. She said that the family preferred the story that Satan had visited Loftus Hall over the truth, that Anne's lover was very much of this world, that she became pregnant out of wedlock, and that her child was murdered to keep this a secret. And that tragedy is why her spirit haunts the hall. John Loftus died in April of 1889, leaving Loftus Hall to his cousin. The renovations had put the Loftus family into severe debt, so much so that his cousin decided he needed to sell the property. Benedictine monks would now live in the home until 1935. Following them, the Sisters of Providence converted Loftus Hall into a convent and school. Although it is unknown if the nuns encountered the spirit of Lady Anne, they did experience significant tragedy during their time at Loftus Hall. Four nuns would die on the property. Two of them drown in the bay. One died falling down a back staircase. A cross marks a spot where she fell to her death. And the fourth nun died falling down the house's grand staircase. In 1983, Kay and Michael Devereaux purchased Loftus Hall and opened the Loftus Hall Hotel, which closed down in the late 90s. According to Tim Kelly, the founder of Irish Ghost Hunters, Michael Devereaux died in the 80s, and then his wife continued running the hotel alone for a few years before fleeing the country. According to rumors, she fled because the house told her to get out. In 2011, Loftus Hall was purchased by Shane and Aidan Quigley. The Quigleys repaired the roof, other structural damage, then opened the house for ghost tours in 2012. Aidan Quigley told Irish Central, At Loftus Hall, there is no need for overstated gory props or effects. The house has a very twisted and tortured history, and so naturally speaks for itself. We have had reports from many ghost hunting groups and specter seekers who recount rather unsettling results, such as significant temperature drops, particularly in the chapel and the tapestry room, and spikes in electromagnetic fields indicating an unseen energy source. Visitors to Loftus Hall continually experience and qualify these findings and many encounter things that they can't quite explain. He said in an interview for the show Ghost Adventures, there are certain areas in the house where I'll walk through. It's as if it's pushing me away. A lot of people wonder why we don't go upstairs on our tours of the house. I think there's areas that, it might seem weird, but they don't want anybody there. It's very rare I actually go up the stairs. Aiden said that the worst thing he's ever seen in the home happened during an evening tour. The lights went out in the tapestry room just as a door to the room shut and locked. And then in the darkness, a man on the tour seemed to transform into another person and suddenly attacked and grabbed a young girl by the neck and started to choke <gasps> her. The staff had to break down the door to pull him off of her. Holy shit. Aiden said it's the only time I ever saw pure evil in the house. Alan Boland, the tour manager, noted that after the Quigleys purchased the house, they found several religious statues with their heads missing. He theorized that the spirits focused their anger on religious icons. Aiden Quigley estimated that during his not quite a decade of ownership, almost 500,000 people came to Loftus Hall for ghost tours, and a good portion of these visitors claimed that they captured evidence of the supernatural. There were so many reports, the staff started keeping a log at the reception desk. Loftus Hall closed down in 2020 and was put on the market that summer for 2.5 million euros. The home finally sold in August of 2021 to Patty McKillen from Press Up Hospitality Group. Press Up made plans to turn Loftus Hall into a luxury hotel called Ladyville House. Restoration began in October of 2021. According to the Irish Independent, Press Up wants to exercise the ghostly history of Loftus Hall. Loftus Hall has been closed to the public for three years now, rebranded as Ladyville House. The old building is expected to reopen in early 2024. James Gleason, Ladyville House's new hotel manager, said, There's an amazing history and story to be told, and the building will always be part of that but we are looking to the next chapter of it. We are working with historians as we want to tell the real history of it. Both will be part of the offering, but we won't be doing ghost tours. We'll have to wait to find out if Lady Anne's spirit will once again be upset that further renovations have been made to her tapestry room. I think that they should invite us. Uh-huh. And we should stay into the, we should stay in the tapestry room. Okay. Like they should, you know. Buy really? Some, you want to stay in one of these rooms now? Listen, 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 listen. I think yeah. they should buy us like really nice airfare you know bring <laughs> okay. us over there yeah totally and we'll stay in the room mm -hmm. and we'll set up cameras we'll do the whole thing and we'll just prove that like 
it's just apps. They have absolutely exercised it. I'm surprised that you want to stay there that so bad that you're willing to do this. Because usually you're like, you're out of these things. No, I'm well, it's not haunted anymore. Hey, free trip, know? free trip to Ireland, maybe. Nailed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a few pictures. I want some Magners. <laughs> Uh, this first one, Loftus Hall, as it looked prior to how it was, uh, for, when it was renovated for the uh, the ghost tours. So when it was a little bit busted up and looking nice and spooky. Yeah. That uh, upstairs window with the curtains uh -huh, blowing, blowing out. That, yeah. That's a good detail. Yep. Good shot. Uh, this next picture is of the tapestry room before it was kind of cleaned up. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love, I don't know what it's called, but when uh, on a ceiling, when you yeah. have a light fixture coming down, but on the ceiling, there is like an ornate. Yeah, those decorations, a decorative where the fixture comes from. Yeah, I don't know, I know. I know what it's called either. Filigree or something? I don't know. That's not right. Uh, and, and these pictures, you just go to Scared to Death Podcast uh, on Instagram or Facebook and you can check these out as you're listening. Uh, this next one, Anne Sealed Tomb, uh, believed to be Anne Sealed Tomb. Oh, no headstone, no proof. Mm hmm. And then uh, finally, a picture of Loftus Hall taken near the end of its recent haunted house day. So looking a little nicer. Okay. I mean, I can see how it will make a gorgeous hotel. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and the photo that you showed of the tapestry room, I mean, the insides actually look to be in mm -hmm. really good shape. Yeah. And I'm sure, yeah, they've, you know, they've put a couple years more renovations into it. And I didn't have any more pictures. Uh, uh, showing it from a distance, but when you look at this place from a distance, it's at this on this peninsula, and it's surrounded by so much greenery, like mm. a very rural area. But cool. it would be like on a, on a night, like you know, with during good weather, like a beautiful place to just like walk across the green, you know, uh, grassy areas surrounding the hotel, where you're right along the ocean, where waves are crashing into the rocks. It's really pretty. So it's a good place to kill someone. Totally, it's good, a good very place to easy push somebody. Of a body. Mm -hmm, there's some cliffs there. You could definitely push somebody off into the rocks. So about that trip, I want to take. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's a cool story. The detail about, uh, her, her tomb being sealed, uh -huh. that, that really got me. Cause I was yeah. like, well, you know, I mean, I understand that in that day and by some standards, by some people's standards yet still today, premarital sex is like the worst, you know, yeah, it's yeah, a terrible, yeah. terrible thing, but then especially, so it's kind of crazy to think that this family would make up this insane story about cloven hooves uh -huh. and a baby and a baby a in the murder. wall. And then we had to, we had to, you know, seal her tomb. But then all these years later, when they find baby bones in mm -hmm. the walls, it's like, oh my God, was there a devil character or were you just terrible fucking people? Yeah. Or did they think there was, or did they think, I know, did, did she have some, yep. Did she have some kind of hysterical breakdown and, and think she saw what she saw and it's like, and then was, pre I mean, who knows? Who knows? A lot of different things could have happened, but yeah, the fact that, uh, they either killed a baby or didn't provide proper like medical assistance for someone to help birth the baby uh -huh. and were like, uh, ashamed and worried about the secret and Oh, you know, got to keep that family name intact. I know there is what so many strange. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so I'm many not, examples of that in history. Well, yeah, and it's like I don't. It's hard because you know we're looking back mm -hmm. on it. Like, what were you thinking? But yeah. if you were caught up in those times, you know, if that was, I bet there your was, family name yeah. was really, really important. I bet there was a lot of people who weren't though too. I mean, it's just like today, there are so many people today. Sure. Who, who are just so worried about like keeping up with the Joneses and keeping up appearances as opposed to just really truly being concerned for like the health and well-being of all their family members. Oh man. You know, having that be like the the primary motivation for concern. I uh I'm I like really have been trying to curb my social media intake this uh -huh. year. Like really and really trying to like clean up my feed. I know you cleaned out your feed and yeah. added like a bunch of like animal <laughs> feeds yeah, yeah, yeah. just to make it. I mean, we have to have it, Lighten right? It's it part of our job, mm -hmm. you know, and and listen, I've I find good things there sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I pop saw on this, Instagram a lot. Yeah, I found this this post came across my feed this morning and the essence of it was like we're all dying a little bit every day and when you die mm -hmm. there's only going to be a handful of people who are really going to care. Mm -hmm. So why are you living your life oh, yeah, in a yeah, way yeah. that you care what everyone else thinks? I know. Like like maybe those five or whatever people, you know whatever like kind of yeah. they it's like yeah, you know, you should care to a certain degree about like does your partner respect you? Like, are you behaving in a way where like the person that you're with is, yeah. you know, whatever, or like, are you, you know what I mean? It's like, that kind of thing. Like, like, are you a good person? It, is it internal or external to motivation? That's what I think. Yeah. Where it's like, I want to be a good person because it's important to me to try to live life according to how I think is the, is the most moral way to live overall. Yeah. It's like, I can have like dark humor, whatever like that. That's not immoral to me, but I don't want to like, just be unnecessarily yeah, hurtful. Not immoral, to, it's just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Coping. 
as opposed to wanting to wanting people to perceive me yeah, as yeah. a good person. It's like I want to just live the life like according to my own internal standards. And then if other people, you know, if they find that to be good, that's a great bonus. Yeah. But that's not the motivation. It's not so other people can be like, hey, man, you're doing a good job. Yeah. And I wish more people would do that. Like, do it for yourself mm -hmm. and and and, be, and just do it like altruistically in a sense or like, uh, I don't know, there's like this philosophical stuff about like, what's the best way to behave? And if you're doing things, if you're doing good things, so people think, hey, that's somebody who does good things, then it, it devalues it. Totally. It's like, well, you're doing it for appearances sake. Or are you doing it simply because it's the right thing to do? You believe it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Stop. Period. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And then this wasn't even about that. This was about just yeah. like dress how you want to dress, love who you want to love. Just oh, like, this post, yeah. just don't yeah. worry so much about mm -hmm. all these other people. Like, they're, because when you die, mm -hmm. all those people, they don't care. Yeah, they don't. Exactly. It, it doesn't matter. And they're, or maybe they're going to care for like a brief moment, but like, mm -hmm. who's really going to care? Like, yeah. those handful of people that are really close to you. Yeah. So, like, let that, let them sort of be a little bit of like a moral compass. This is, this is so random, but this mentality is one of the reasons I love Charles Barkley. Oh my god, I love Charles Barkley. You've also, come around. You, you've. Uh, uh, I never disliked him. No, but you. But I, I think I sold you on him. I think I was the one who was like talking about him a lot. But what I love is like there's old interviews of him in his like basketball days. Yeah. And some people think he was like an asshole mm. uh, for saying the things he said. Mm -hmm. Like he would be so blunt mm -hmm. and just basically like tell reporters that he didn't give a shit what they thought because they weren't oh. players. Like they don't know. Or and, and he would say things about the fans. He's like. What do I care what somebody who doesn't play the game thinks about my plane? But I loved it. I love because, that. Because it's like, to me, it's like, yeah, he was his own person, still is very much to this day. Yeah. And, but he is a good dude. You look into his life. Yeah. He's a great husband. He's a great dad. He's like all these good qualities. I think he's a good friend, like all these cool things. He's not like perfect and none of us are, but he, I just love that. He's like, I don't give a shit what you think about me. I do love that about sports mm -hmm. just in general too because it's like I'm not a huge I love to watch a game yeah. or whatever but I'm not like deeply invested. Yeah. But I being from Cleveland uh, we're like as a as a people like overly invested in teams there. It, yeah. it, it is such a part of the culture there. Yeah. And like my family and I'm like you guys none of you even made it to collegiate sports. Stop <laughs> with the like they should do this and they should do that. Yeah, you don't and know. how I'm like do you, did did you study this sport? Yeah, did, yeah, yeah. Did you play it? Did you yeah. like? Come mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. you don't fucking know. Like you're just sitting on a couch, yelling yeah. at a TV. And but they but they get so oh. upset, like it, like genuinely upset. Not just like uh -huh. in the heat of the moment, enjoying the game. Like ah, oh, why didn't he catch that pass? It's like there's debates going on look, about. Look it. Like, the, you guys, calm down. Look in the comments uh, of like a post by any like athlete of renown yeah like Le like lebron james Aww. kills me i love lebron james i love lebron james and when you look into like the comments under his like posts no matter what he posts yeah there are just people saying he's trash that he's not as good as so and so and it's, oh, yeah. and it's like god what is going on in your life when you feel like you have to leave a comment telling lebron james that he's not a good ba basketball player like you only look <laughs> stupid that's really funny he is you don't have to like him he's objectively fucking i don't care what you think one of the greatest basketball players no, of him. any time nope. of all time nope. by no, I any metric I by said any not. metric i said he's not yep. you know what i mean but then there's some dipshit on a couch somewhere being like you, you trash bro, lebron fucking michael jordan blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's like oh man let's, let's good get, job wasting however long it took you to leave that comment let's get back on track Did okay. you look at how cute these are now i think that somebody gave these to you maybe in virginia beach yes because they came home in a suitcase mm -hmm. i just don't know which trip they came virginia home beach. from I, I know that's, that's awesome I am work. So cute. Look at this little, <laughs> little doll. I'm I like I'm obsessed with myself. This is so cute. I you know what? I, I like that they um with me gave you more hair than you have? I was literally just gonna say that. I know. They were generous I'm with my hairline. I know. They're sweet. And then we got these other two little fluffy guys. These little monster guys. Wait, put you next to me. We're, okay. We're a couple. Come on. Let's hold hands. Okay. And then we got those little fluffy guys. And those little monsters are cute too. And those little monsters, they remind me of ugly dolls. Do you remember mm -hmm. ugly dolls? I do. Yeah. Kids loved them for a while. Mm-hmm. Super into it. Okay. You ready? Let's go, dude. Let's go, bro. Hey, Dan. Hey, Lindsay. I was raised Catholic, as was my mother and her twin sister, and I believe that this is part of the reason we are all so impacted by scary stories about demons and the like. We are also very sensitive to those types of things, like when you go someplace and can tell something isn't quite right, like there's something or someone else there and something's not quite right about an item. This story is an account of one of those times. My aunt told me this story and was kind enough to let me submit her experience for all the creeps, peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles mm -hmm. out there to enjoy. 
I first encountered the incense burner when my in-laws were moving into an assisted living facility. We were in the process of preparing their home for sale, clearing out things they no longer needed, and cleaning in the process. My husband was going through items in the basement, and he found it inside of a box. The incense burner was made of a brushed metal and looked to be an Egyptian woman lying on her stomach, looking forward with her arms outstretched, holding a pot. The pot was able to hold incense to be burned. He remembered it from his childhood and that his father had picked it up at a flea market of sorts when he was very young. Maybe it was because of the nostalgia that he liked it, but he decided to bring it home. The moment I laid eyes on it, I had a bad feeling. I couldn't put my finger on it. I just knew something felt off about it. My husband placed it on the mantle of our fireplace in the living room and told me he was going to light the incense. I promptly replied, no, you are not going to light that ugly thing. I told him I didn't like it and that there was something creepy about it and I didn't want it in our house. Of course, he thought I was being ridiculous and it stayed on the mantle in front of one of the two large decorative stone plaques that also resided there. The first strange occurrence happened shortly after she arrived. It was 3 a.m. and we had fallen asleep in the living room watching television. My husband was on the couch and I was on the floor not far from our fireplace. Our two cats were also in the room, one cat lying on him and the other on the couch. We were all sound asleep and when, and when we were all sound asleep and were suddenly awakened by a loud crashing noise. I jumped up to turn on the light and saw one of my favorite stone plaques we had on the mantle now on the hearth of the fireplace broken into pieces with one large piece close to where I had been asleep on the floor. It's important to note that these plaques were very heavy and had been in the same spot on the mantle for years and had never fallen or even moved before. I probably wouldn't have thought it was so weird except that right in front of the plaque that fell was the incense burner. I couldn't figure out how this plaque fell off the mantle and broke without knocking the incense burner off with it. There was just no way for that to happen. It was as if the plaque was lifted up and over the incense burner and then tossed on the ground, and that was the only way the incense burner wouldn't have fallen off along with the plaque. Also creepy that it occurred at 3 a.m. Even the cats wouldn't come back in the room after it happened. I truly felt it was mad at me for saying that it was ugly. Because of that, it broke something I liked. The second strange occurrence was a few nights later when I was in the family room watching television after my husband had gone upstairs to bed. I heard what sounded like someone walking around upstairs and then it sounded like footsteps coming down the stairs. I called out to my husband to see if everything was okay. I assumed that it was him, but there was no answer. I got up and turned on the light in the hallway, walked down the hall to the bottom of the stairs to see what was going on. It was at this point I could hear my husband snoring loudly upstairs in our bedroom. We were the only two people in the house at the time because our kids were off at college and both cats were asleep in the family room next to me. After that night, there were multiple occasions when I would hear what sounded like someone walking around in various areas of the house. Most of the time it would be upstairs, but there were times when I would hear it in the hallway, on the stairs, and in the laundry area off of the garage. It wasn't until it wasn't just the house creaking or soft noises either. It was heavy steps, like a good-sized adult was walking around. Each time, the pets were near me, so I always knew it wasn't them. And I told my sister-in-law, Dee, about all the stuff that had been happening, and she was a little creeped out and told a friend about it. Her friend said that I needed to tell whatever was there that this was my house, and their antics were not welcome. After I heard that, I told my husband that she had to go, and I took the incense burner to Dee's house and put it on a shelf in the garage. After I removed the burner from my home, I never heard anyone walking around again. Shortly after, Mm -hmm. Dee was gone for an evening and I had agreed to check on her dog and take it out to do its business. The only way into her house was through the garage with a code because I didn't have a key to the door. I went through the garage and into the house. Her dog, usually excited to see me and would run up to me, but when I tried to get him to go through the garage door, he kept hanging back and wouldn't come with me. It took a lot of coaxing and me taking him by the collar through the garage to even get him out. I got him back in the house and got out of the garage as quickly as I could. My fear of the incense burner became a running joke with the family, and Dee decided she would bring the burner into her house to see if anything more would happen. She thought it was funny that it scared me, and that I thought it was cursed. She brought it in from the garage and put it on top of her piano. Not long after she brought it into her house, Dee started having strange occurrences of her own. One evening, while watching TV, the chandelier above her dining table fell. Another evening, her window blinds fell off the windows. She had had no issues with either of these things prior to that. 
And suddenly, Dee wasn't feeling so comfortable having that incense burner in her house either. So Dee ended up taking it back to my father-in-law, who was now in assisted living, and he placed it on the windowsill in his bedroom. He laughed about the strange occurrences that she and I told him about. He said he hadn't had issues with it in the past. It's important to note that he would rub the back side of the woman or pat her bottom <laughs> each time he passed it and would say things like she had a good form or was beautiful and that to our knowledge, he never had any issues with it. I'm thinking that she liked his attention and probably left him alone. Both of my in-laws have since passed away and I have no idea where the incense burner is. I haven't seen it in any of the belongings we have in our home after cleaning in our home after cleaning out their apartment and I hope I never do. It seems to have simply disappeared. I can only think that someone else picked it up or kept it or he gave it away to someone. Regardless, I never want to see that incense burner again. Thanks for taking the time. Stay spoopy, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Is that so funny at the yep, end? Yep, that's that's funny. That I detail. It's a cool story. <laughs> Cracked me up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can like picture your grandpa just like, <laughs> nice uh, form. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess we've heard like other stories similar to this, or it could be somebody's shirt, could be whatever, it could be somebody you know, somebody's item that like they're yeah. they're attached to or use a lot or. I don't know. Uh, it, 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 I don't know where that stuff comes from, where it's like, how does your energy get transferred into an object? I don't know. And like, you know, could just be a possessed object and it, it really, whatever essence is connected to it, didn't like the way that she was talking about it mm -hmm. or just like felt more comfortable with her father-in-law and just wanted to like be back with her rightful owner kind of thing. Like this isn't yours. This doesn't belong to you. Take me back to my person. Maybe, maybe that little like object, whatever is attached to this incense burner was like looking out for her father-in-law. Maybe uh -huh. she helped him pass to the other side. Maybe she helped him find his wife on the other side. Like maybe it had a, the spirit attached to it had a mission mm -hmm. and was irritated that it was separated from, you know, it's, it's thing that it was supposed to do. Like, I just think there's so many scenarios that you can run with it. Right, right. Like, what little entity could it be? Could it be, I guess, a ghost? Could it be something else entirely? Why do things get attached to objects? I mean, there's been cursed objects. There's been, you know, people's possessions where it's like it's a family heirloom or uh -huh. whatever, and they believe it's like the spirit of an ancestor. Yeah. This thing, <clears throat> who knows who owned it before he did? Sure. Yeah, because it, it got picked up at a flea market, so you really yeah. don't know yeah. anything about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, yeah. I like that story. Yeah, me too. Yeah, good one. Uh-huh. All right. Do you have time for one more, Dan? I do have time for one more. Okay, good. It's, I'm, I'm glad. Hello. Here's the story of the little girl in the painting. For some backstory. Two my, objects today. I know. Uh, for some backstory, my parents got divorced when I was six, and my mom dated the same man for about nine years. Then, in my junior year of high school, she started dating someone new. And it took a long time for her to date him because he was rather wealthy and lived in a super big, secured, gated community while we had financially struggled my whole life. My mom was worried people were going to think she was a gold digger, for a lack of better terms. About a year later, he convinced her to move us in with him into his giant borderline mansion home. Mm -hmm. I was alone one night while they were out to dinner, and my new soon to be almost stepbrother was out with his friends i decided to look around some rooms and some closets because hello nosy there was a very small room slash closet underneath the stairway however still bigger than harry potter's first bedroom <laughs> that they used for random storage i was in there looking around and found a stack of framed paintings leaning against the wall under a shelf i started pulling them back and looking at them upside down from above most of them were landscapes and fairly boring I pulled the last one back and peering out at me with her head on the floor as this was upside down in the stack was a little girl with dark hair, blue eyes, in a white dress, holding a fluffy black puppy. I paused because she looked so familiar, but then I just assumed I'd seen this image somewhere before. Fast forward to that night, I had the most vivid, crazy dream of my life. <laughs> In the dream, my mom and I lived in the giant house alone, and I had a sleep disorder that caused me to stay awake during specific phases of the moon. My neighbor in the dream had the same disorder, so anytime we were both awake, we'd go to our respective backyards and talk. Well, that night, I went downstairs to talk to the neighbor, but found my mom awake at the small table in the kitchen, which was now by the back door. In both real life and in the dream, the stairway was broken up by a small landing. And when no one had gone up or down the stairs in a couple of minutes, the landing would make a loud creaking sound when someone finally did step on it. This, of course, made sneaking home past my curfew 
very difficult. Anyways, back to my dream. My mom sitting at the table and I was standing facing her with my back to the back door. She said she stayed awake to have a serious conversation with me when she knew I'd be awake. And then we heard the creak of the stairs. Our faces froze, looking at each other and waiting for something to break the silence. And then we heard footsteps, very small footsteps. My hand reached behind my back, trying to turn the doorknob, but I couldn't turn my back to whatever was coming. The feeling of needing to scream was building fast and heavy, but nothing was coming out. As the footsteps got closer, her small figure started to form out of the darkness, the little girl from the painting. As soon as I saw her, I started getting snapshot images of literally every single nightmare I'd ever had in my whole life. She was in all of them, standing in a corner, sitting in a chair, quiet, usually in the darkness. But she was there. And then I woke up terrified. I was lying on my back and there was pressure on my hips and on my wrists, almost like a small child was pinning me down. I was trying to reach the lamp by my head, but I could not move my arms. Now, I know what you're thinking, sleep paralysis, but my legs were flailing wildly. I was throwing my head around. I was trying to shake the grip that this thing had on me. I couldn't scream, but I could hear myself grunting and crying. When I was finally able to touch the lamp and get the light turned on, it was all gone. She had been in every single nightmare ever since then. Only now, she's not shrouded in darkness trying to hide. She appears in plain view, and honestly, she's become almost like a trigger to let me know that I am having a nightmare, and it lets me wake up. After talking with a few friends and my energetic healer about this, almost everyone said I should talk to her. She was obviously trying to tell me something, or maybe she was just there to let me know when I was having a nightmare. Maybe she was protecting me. So I tried finally. In my dreams, I walked up to her and asked her who she was. Instead of a response from her, I woke up again feeling that pressure on my hips and on my wrists. And this time I didn't panic as my now wife was asleep next to me and I didn't want to wake her up. And it only lasted a few seconds. It took a couple of years for me to see her again. This time, and the last time up until this point, I was back in that giant house, but I was with my wife in the dream. We had a kid, which isn't on either one of our radars in real life. And we had come home from a date night and we'd walked the babysitter out and gone upstairs to go to bed. And then we heard a noise downstairs and I went to check it out. As I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw from the back a woman with dark hair, dressed in white, standing in our living room. Oh my God. And when she turned around, her bright blue eyes felt like they were drilling into me. I screamed at her to leave and suddenly she was inches from my face. Her face twisted into a scream, though no sound was coming out of her. Her hands went for my throat. I woke up coughing. Any notion of that girl being there to protect me was gone. I know it was her, just the grown-up version. I had a sore throat the whole next day. I am terrified to see her again. I have no theories on who or what she is. And also, as a footnote, I have never experienced any other sleep paralysis type moments outside of seeing her those two times. Thanks, y'all. Shell. Thanks, Shell. If I'm, if I'm getting all this right, it's, uh, it's like Shell sees this painting has a nightmare and then in the nightmare uh has a, a se- sequence of events of like flashbacks to other previous nightmares yes. where noticing that this like girl from the painting is in nightmare she's already had yes and then see, that would be so freaky that's like uh i have i can't think of something similar to that that, would, that that's like something out of a horror movie or maybe maybe there has been something like that in horror movies something similar but that's great uh, yeah it's i mean a, not great for her not great for her but like it's a God, cool- that's, Good and creepy. Yeah, it's a really interesting concept to explore because mm-hmm. when she sees the painting for the first time, if I'm understanding her writing correctly, when she sees the painting for the very first time, it has a sense of familiarity to her. Yeah, like deja vu. But I get that because it's like, you know, oftentimes, I'm, you know, you see a painting, but then you've seen prints of that painting in other places like throughout sure, your life, sure. right? Like it's like, we all know a like Monet. A, we yeah, all, you know, yeah. there's certain it's things. Known painting, yeah. So it's like, if you see it and you're like, oh, that feels familiar. That wouldn't bother me. I would never think. I would mm-hmm. never make that leap of like, yeah. wait a second, that lady's been showing up in my nightmares my whole life. Right. Right. Yeah, that'd be a terrible nightmare to have. Terrible. And, and then going forward, you just keep seeing the same girl in your dreams, like over, and then you're just, like afraid to fall asleep because you mm-hmm. might want to see her again. I'd almost want to like go get that painting and destroy it. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe there's, I don't know, maybe go get the painting, peel the back off. Is there like, mm. like, is there something more oh, to man. it? Like a mystery? Well, because she says that in this like final time that she has seen her in her dreams, she's now the grown up version of herself. So she goes from being a little girl yeah, yeah. to being a. So I'm like, oh, at some point is is the older version? Is she going to get even older? Are you going to see her die? Like, yeah. what? Are you going to get yeah. more of her story? More guidance? What? Yeah, I don't know. I uh, I forgot to tell you, I, I had another uh, 
either, at least one, if not more nightmares last night. I've been having like remembering dreams more lately. And, oh. and it's been like, I don't remember having a series of nightmares. You've never been like a big dreamer. Mm -mm. And, and lately, like the one last night, I, I totally forgot about it. You know, I remember when I woke up and then. Right. Uh, Your day went, goes yeah, on. Yeah, my yep. day and just forgot about it until just now. But um, it was something about like, yeah, you and I, and I was like stuck in some place. Almost like another dimension. So you're like, like where we went there and then you returned and then like I was left there. Oh dear. And I was by myself in some scary place that was like this dimension kind of like ours, but not good and not ours. And I couldn't get back over here. Is this because we're watching The Leftovers? I think so. Is That's anybody else watching that? That you show guys? is trippy. I am so into it. I, okay. I love it because it's a little bit of everything that I like. It has a, like a def definite mystery element. Yeah. And we're currently... Eight episodes from finishing it up in yeah. season three. So we'll let you know. Uh, but yeah, it has like a like a little bit of mystery. It, it mm -hmm. definitely has like an edge of your seat, like what is going to happen next. Yeah. There's an interesting like weird like love triangle situation that is there's, quite- There's so much going on in that show. Yeah. The love triangle situation is quite comical. Yeah. Uh, there's like, you know, the missing people, like kind of like murder element. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of like a sci-fi, which I am generally not a sci-fi person. Mm -hmm. It. It has a similar vibe as Yellow Jackets did mm. of just like, mm -hmm. what is happening here? And there's a bunch of religious themes and stuff, specifically Christian stuff going on too, or mm -hmm. like the more you know or about, and the, the more you would know about scripture, the more like things I think would hit you. Absolutely. In, in, in this show. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's very well done. It's wild. And then it's also- not what I thought it would be. No. In a good and way. you picked it. I picked it. I didn't think it would be nearly this weird. I love it. Yeah. It, it, it would not be a good show to watch- on like, any drugs. Yeah, because it's like, all. because then you'd be like, is is the show this weird or am I super high? That did happen to us. Like we had taken like our sleepy time gummies. Mm -hmm, just like, just like And we gummies. were like, whoa. I I really, it, and that was like the first, the very first episode because uh -huh. I think it's the first episode yeah. or second. There is a high school party scene that I was, we were both <laughs> kept looking <laughs> at right, each other. Yeah. We were like, is, oh, is this, this happening? happening or uh -huh. are we really gone? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's just kind of how the whole show is. Yeah. And it is fascinating. It's really good. I am obsessed with how tiny of a human Justin Thoreau. Justin Thoreau is. Yeah, specifically his legs. You're very like, um, you have a lot of concerns about how, his, how little his legs are. I'm like, buddy, like his one thigh. Mm-hmm. He's shredded. He's like he's, he's like shredded. he's gonna rip. He he doesn't do a bulking face. No, he's not. He's not trying to see how much weight he can throw around a gym. He's cardio on point. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I just feel like his muscle thigh tongue. is like my maybe mm -hmm. may, maybe my bicep. He's like that. Like 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 my thigh is like six of his thighs. Mm -hmm. He looks to me like like typical Hollywood leading man strong. Yeah. Where there's like The Rock and those guys are obviously big dudes. Yeah. But then there's like the rest of them, like the Tom Cruise size guys. Yeah, that are like, like between 5'10 and 6 feet tall. No, or shorter, less than 5'10. Be nice. Um, but they're like, <laughs> but they're these guys where it's like, they, they're they like doing all this action tough guy moves and yeah, fights yeah. in the show and it looks cool. And I'm not like a fighter and like some exceptionally over the top strong person, but I'm like, I'm confident that I could just, I wouldn't need to know much fighting because I could just pick him up and literally just throw him across the room. I think you'd be surprised. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will say this. Just yeah. having like been in that world. Yeah. Like they're pretty fucking ripped people. Like, Oh, no, he's yeah. way more ripped than me. Yeah. But that doesn't, but I just, from going to the gym just over size. the years, it doesn't translate to strength. A lot of, you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. there, there's people who like look really like they're very toned. Yeah. But strength wise, they're actually not very strong. I don't know why. I was just. And then, there's, and then there's guys who just look like oafs, like big, like heavy set guys. Yeah. Beasts. Strength yeah. wise. Yeah. I guess when you look at those like strongest man competitions and stuff. They don't have like a. If you saw them. G.I. Joe like, figure body. Right. Like if you saw them not in that competition, mm -hmm. just in like regular street. Yeah, you clothes. might think they're really overweight. Yeah. They, But it's like, yeah, they have some padding. Different kind of strength. But so much muscle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand the padding with the muscle underneath. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I really get it. Dan, could you yeah. just small reference back to your dream? Could that yeah. op also represent subconsciously you not wanting to go back to how busy you used to be? And then totally. seeing like the light of the, uh, light of the maybe. Tunnel, but I guess it is. Like I a, love dream a, interpretation. Yeah, it is a transitional uh, moment for me. And so maybe mm -hmm. that's why I'm having so many dreams lately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been having weird dreams. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I yeah, I've never really studied dream interpretation. Have you, Tyler? No, I just grew up in the church. <laughs> oh, okay. But like in, in your <laughs> that's church, the best answer. In your church, would they do a dream interpretation though? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, hmm. for sure. I mean, like that's a that's a part of like quote unquote Christianity. 
Um, oh no, I was never, never around, around any churches that would do that. Like dream interpret. That's cool. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because more like as like prophecy, right, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, those are those they would people would say like a prophet and a dream interpret, like somebody who can interpret dreams are two different people. Like for example, totally. Like, uh, in the Bible, Daniel could interpret dreams, but he could also he was also a, a prophet. But then also there were like prophets who couldn't interpret dreams. So it's like different types of gifts, quote unquote, of the spirit. I guess. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm, mm. You can tell it's been a long time since I've been at church, but as you were saying those things, I was like, that's right. I, I am fascinated with dreams, you know, like as are a lot of people, like researchers. Yeah. We still we don't know why we do we, it. We don't, nobody knows for sure, like what they mean, why they're there. There's all, there's theories. Yeah. But nobody knows for sure. Yeah. I had like a stretch of time where I was dreaming about turtles a lot. I forget what that means, <laughs> but like a lot, like so much so that one of my girlfriends bought me like a necklace with a turtle on it. Huh. But I think it had something to do with like change or I don't know. Because we all know certain dreams. There's like the teeth falling out dream. Or the dream. I don't know that dream. You don't know that dream? God, I thought everybody had that dream. <laughs> it's like your teeth are falling out. It's it has to do with like yeah, it has to do with like change and fear. That's creepy. I I've never had is. any dreams where people's teeth are falling out. Oh. Not yours? No. Oh. That sounds like a terrible dream. <laughs> I hope I just put it into your subconscious and I hope you probably yeah, probably now I'm gonna have some weird ass dreams where my teeth are crumbling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're on stage telling oh the my God. joke about turtles <laughs> ah, and, then and straws teeth. and your teeth are falling out. <laughs> spitting teeth out and stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah dream interpretation is fascinating. Yeah. You know what else is really fascinating? Um, I'm going to start reading this book called The Body Keeps the Score or or Your Body Keeps Score or something, but it's like about how we uh, internalize traumas. And, mm-hmm. and like it could be obviously like a huge trauma. It could just be like, you know, a friendship breaking up. L- l- like like not even uh, in a big dramatic way, but just like something that emotionally you have to process and like where like different kinds of things settle in your body. Yeah. And as you guys know, like I have all these problems with my hips, which are very real. Like scientifically, like here's the x-ray, here's the MRI. Like there's absolutely scientifically, medically something going on with my hips. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not going to be fixed through like meditation. Like, you know what I mean? You can't repair like a, a labral tear yeah. with just like yeah, my yeah, woo-woo. Yeah. But what's interesting about it is it's like different things that happen in your life will settle into different areas of your body. And so it's like um, like different emotional traumas. So Emily was just sending me some stuff today where she was saying, she's like, listen, I obviously know that there's something wrong with you, but like it's been really flared up in the past two weeks. Mm-hmm, and she's mm-hmm. like, I just want you to read this and I want you to sit down and think about, like meditate on like, what emotional things have I been mm. processing? So it's sort of like the the I haven't read the pages yet, but what I imagine it's going to be like is I don't think you've had panic attacks, but I've suffered with panic attack, panic attacks on and off my entire life, and that is in the chest, right? Like yeah. it's like hard to breathe, but it's like for me those come on from like severe stress and anxiety. But like, why does it settle here? Why don't I get diarrhea? Why don't I vomit? Like, why is it yeah. hard to breathe? And there's like whole, all these like different sort of Woo woo, kind of yeah. like reasons why they think like those different. Maybe I've been panicking my whole life, and that's why I constantly have diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm in a nearly constant state of panic <laughs> and just didn't realize it. And that's why I have like oh, such a terrible stomach. You don't have you don't have um, ISBD, right? Right? Or I, yeah, uh, irritable bowel I, syndrome. IBS, yeah. IBSD. Uh, you just like I just am panicking. You're just in a constant state of panic. right. I just don't feel it in my mind okay. or my chest. I just feel it in your mostly in my butthole. In your butt. Okay. But mm-hmm. like that could, there is, it's just like this thing like of, you know, we just always like in our side of the world, we just immediately go to like medicine. Yeah. We're like, okay, well, there's something wrong medicine. It's like, yes, but also like getting to like that root cause. So it's like, you know, yeah. okay, why this is such an easy like example for me. The like last big bout of panic attacks I had was when all the stuff with my hip started happening, mm-hmm. right? And they wanted me to have this insane surgery. And somewhere in my gut, I knew it wasn't the right choice. Yeah. But yeah. the doctors and the professionals and the specialists and multiples were like, yeah, this is this is a viable option for mm-hmm. you. But I was so upset. I was so panicked. I was so freaked out. It's like my body was telling me, like, trust your gut. You know what's best for your body. Yeah. Like, don't do this thing. And then as soon as I was able to like get it under control, really think about it and get in touch with my body and think about like how much pain am I really am? Is yeah. it worth going through this? As soon as I made the decision not to have that surgery, my panic attacks went away. And wow. I'm not I'm not saying that it's like always that easy just in this one example yeah. of my life yeah. of a period of panic attacks. It was like, oh, if 
And then as soon as I kind of like healed that trauma, I went to my therapist, I worked through it. Like what was I, what was really going on? We were going through a really tough time with one of our kids. Mm -hmm. There was so many other things going on. It wasn't about the hips. It was about so many other things. That was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. I wasn't listening to my body. Yeah. It's fascinating. I, I've never, uh, I've never told you this, but uh, and I'm here we go. Not, no, I'm not joking. Okay, I'm not actually not joking. I thought you can do a wiener joke. <laughs> I was no, ready for it. No, I'm not joking. It's like a trauma response, like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But have, uh, and this could be Tyler too. Um, do you ever have like a? This is the weirdest feeling. Do you ever have a weird panic moment where you you think for a second that maybe you died a while back, and that everything that's been happening for a while is just some like afterlife moment, like that this life isn't real. Yeah. You have that moment. I have that every once in a while. I'm like, did I die? Oh yeah. That's really. Are you are you messing? With, are you no, joking? No, no. That doesn't. You like. I just assume that's like a thing that like everybody thinks. Tyler, have you ever had that moment? No, I, no. I always had the moment where like the rapture happened, and uh, like uh, which also sounds like what that left behind or left. Yes. Leftovers. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure, the rapture is a part of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah if you're if you're worried about the rapture, I don't think you should watch that show. <laughs> that's my brain always. Like I always have those thoughts. Wait since a minute. I was a kid. Where you think that you've been taken or you've been left? Like I've been left. And so, like, I'm living out, like, um, a, a scenario where, like, like, say, for example, like, my wife, I haven't, like, my wife hasn't texted me back. And, yep. like, I hit her up and I was like, man, you've either been kidnapped or Jesus came back. Oh, and I'm like, oh, I've been left. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're not coming. You're not texting me back because the rapture happened. You were taken. I was yeah. left behind. And now what? <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay. I get that. But not the other one. Tyler should watch Leftovers. Yeah, I'm going to watch it now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh. Yeah, but I I definitely have moments, I, I okay. guess more frequently than like I really. That makes me feel better because for a second, usually I was like, it's like when things are really good. Like if oh. I would be really brutally honest, it's like when something really good happens in our lives. Oh. I, I think I might even cry just like talking about it. I'll just be like, "There's no way that this is real. I don't deserve this. This isn't oh. okay. I have died, and I am living. Oh. I'm either living out somebody else's life, like Weird. like this isn't even like I feel like out of body yeah. where I'm like." This can't be my life. I don't okay. deserve this. I'm not good enough. I'm not yeah. worthy. It's not okay. What like all these sort yeah. of like crazy thoughts. And I just kind of assume that I am I'm dead and I'm watching a life go on. I am living somebody else's life. I'm outside of my body. Have uh, you had- or, or that it's all just gonna completely like that I'm gonna wake up, that I'm just like in a dream and I'm gonna wake up and I'm be like, oh, of course that didn't happen. That was a dream. That couldn't happen to me. That's too good. Have you had these feelings for years? Always. Okay. My that whole life. Because I started to panic a little recently. I'm like, Maybe I fucked around, did too many psychedelics, and I broke some part of my brain. No, I don't think so. Because I don't remember having that thought ever before the last couple of years. Well, do you, okay. Let Maybe me ask, I did. I don't let know. me ask you this. Like, yeah. as I have, th- people told me like, oh, when you turn 40, I swear to God, it's like the next day, like a switch flips, like something really like, and I don't know if it's just like prompted by that, but in my 39th year, like going into my 40th year, mm-hmm. I just more and more and more, I swear to God, every day became more acutely aware that I'm marching towards my death. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, that, and, that's I mean, like that's a just, numbers thing. I think, I think at, I mean, right, at but, 46, I think about that more than I did for sure at 30. Right, but like also like it's 2023 and for all intents and purposes, like I'm healthy and mm-hmm. there's no like disease that runs in my family. Like I should live for another, at minimum Five another- to 10 years. <laughs> what? <laughs> I should, <laughs> so you take me to Ireland and you throw me off that cliff. <laughs> um, but I should, theoretically, I should live for at least, at least another 40 years. Statistically, yeah. Yeah, I, I might live for 50 years, 60 mm-hmm. years. I mean, you want to make me a robot and have me live forever. Mm-hmm. But like, it's it's interesting how it, like, I'm telling you, like, the first day of being 40, I was like, suddenly, weirdly, acutely aware. So yeah. I I wonder if like the combination of Tyler's in college, Monroe, obviously everybody else is getting older and you kind of forget that when you have kids, like you know mm-hmm. that they're getting older, but you always just think it's only you <laughs> yeah, and not yeah, everyone yeah. else. And it's a strange disassociation we have, but just the, we're like coming up into like, we're, we're very quickly inching towards the next phase of our life where we're yeah. going to have no kids in college or no kids at home, both kids in college. Yeah. And, and we obviously are getting older and uh, slowing down and getting rid of the stand-up tour for next year. It's just like, mm-hmm. you've had a lot of big life cycle things. Yeah. And so maybe that combined with the fact that like you really, like you did a lot of therapeutic work this past year. You did do a lot of psychedelics. Like like you <laughs> you have changed yeah. the synapses yeah. in your brain. You yeah. have changed your response. You've allowed yourself to be more in touch with your emotions. Mm-hmm. So is it like, was it always there and now you're just in touch uh, with it? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Like you just like allowed yourself to open that door a little bit and peek and like, going on over here mm-hmm. yeah maybe totally you're okay though okay okay good okay good 
Yeah. I thought I was cracking up for a second. Well, even if you were, it's okay. <laughs> the craziest people sometimes are the most beautiful people. So, yeah. you know, beautiful mind. There is some quote about that, about, uh, oh my gosh, about the crazies. Uh, I've seen it on t-shirts and things. Oh, that's very helpful. Uh, I'll think of it, I'm sure, as soon as we're done recording. As soon as we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to do some shout outs? I do. Yeah. All right. Do you want me to start or are you going to start? Oh, I can go first. Okay, go. Um, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon yet again for another year. Here we go. Munch McButt, <laughs> Jessica Villafane, Matt Myrold, Jonathan Carmody, Sponge68. I hope that's <laughs> right. S P U N G. No, S P U N J. I Sp Spooge. S no. No, there's an N. S P U N J. Oh. Sponge. Sponge. Yeah, I think Sponge. Sponge 68. Corey Oliver. Spooky Smash. Bre <laughs> breakfast Burrito. <laughs> Do you guys know I hate breakfast burritos? There's oh, a little fact. One of the few people. Uh, I don't really care about burritos in general. It's too uh, it's too mushy. Again, you're one of the few people. I love burritos. Most people love burritos. Ready? Here's let's add to the list of things that Lindsay doesn't really care about that yeah. other people care about. Number one, don't give a shit about pizza. Number two, Ugh. pasta. Meh. Ugh. Three, burritos. PB and J's. Oh. Oh yeah. Hate it. I I'm not into PB and J's. You're a communist. I know. Well, whatever. <laughs> uh Colby Cook, Stefan, and Tishy Bear. Nice. nice. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us here as well. And helping Dan buy a lot of breakfast burritos. <laughs> Faith Anderson, Cole Hardy, Brianna Sony, or Brianna Sony, perhaps. Uh, Roby, Kyle Anderson. Robbie? Maybe Robbie. Yeah, R O B Y? R O B E E. Oh. Uh, Shelby Mullins, Amber Schoolcraft, uh, Jason Harrington, Nick Tolls, and Linda Wilson Gretch. Nice. Okay, I just have three spooky shout outs. Uh, my first one to Rudy, aka the world's greatest manager from Rudy, Sasha, Ebony, and Aria. Happy 36th birthday. Uh, to Emma J from your awesome dad and us here at Scared to Death, we just want to remind you that life can be especially cruel to teenage girls. Hang in there, kiddo. You're going to be more than okay. I personally want to tell you I was not cool, not attractive, not like I was such a like nerdy loser, didn't fit in. Look at me now. Like high school girls are shit. Hang in there, kiddo. You got this. And then today, do you know that this episode comes out on Monroe's birthday? Oh, no. So in Janu oh. January, we have Kyler Monroe and St. Joan. So... Big happy birthday love from us. Ah, And that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Well done. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. I think last week mm -hmm. you might have said to send your personal tales to info at scared to death. Tyler caught it or two episodes ago mm. and he was like, uh, is this right? Okay. Well, I think I said it correct today, right? Um, I th yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you to Tyler C for editing, publishing today's show. Um, for, and dream interpretation. Thank you to <laughs> <laughs> thank you to Heather Rylander organizing the my story emails. Uh, to book editor Drew Atana polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Olivia Lee finding the second story I told this week. As I mentioned, I dug up the first. We're on YouTube if you'd like to watch the show. On Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. And that's it for today. I was trying to jump you, scare you one more time. You're trying to jump me? Whoa. I'm trying to jump you. Uh, Whoa. Enjoy your nightmares. I know it's creeps, been a minute. My God. Creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. <laughs> Bye, y'all. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions robot and then just beat the shit out of them while they're inside the box what are you, you just, triggered you just... <laughs>